on October 30th, 1938, humanity's worst fears came true. At 8 p.m. Central Time, CBS Radio was broadcasting Ramon Raquello and his orchestra from a ballroom live. But shortly after the program began, a news flash interrupted the broadcast, announcing that astronomers had noted a strange phenomena on the surface of Mars, a series of explosions of incandescent gas that looked like a blue jet of flame shot out of a gun aimed right at planet Earth. And they said that they would keep the audience informed with any further updates, and it went back to the ballroom. Well, not long after that, the orchestra was again interrupted with a news flash saying that seismic activity had been detected near Princeton, New Jersey. Not long after that, CBS got a field correspondent at a local farm where a large cylinder, approximately 30 yards in diameter, had slammed into the surface of the earth, creating a deep crater. A field correspondent began interviewing the farmer who owned the piece of property when suddenly he interrupted the interview because he heard a scratching sound coming from inside the cylinder. The crowds who had gathered started inching closer to see what this scratching sound was when suddenly a lid on top of the cylinder began to unscrew and out came a horrendous monster with tentacles and eyes that were black like serpents and a triangle-shaped mouth dripping with saliva. The local police force from that small town who had assembled put together a truce flag and began approaching the creature when it pulled out what the correspondent described as a heat ray that incinerated the police officers, caught the nearby woods and vehicles on fire, and the field correspondent began crying out as we heard the screams of the people in the background that the flames were getting closer when suddenly the broadcast cut off. And there were five seconds of eerie silence on the radio. Then someone back in the studio came all over the airwaves saying that they lost the field broadcast because of some kind of difficulty with the transmission. But then there was an update, another news flash. The state of New Jersey declared martial law. 7,000 National Guardsmen were armed and deployed to the site where the cylinder impacted the earth as 7,000 armed guardsmen approached the cylinder ready to annihilate this alien threat a large tripod of metal came up out of the pit and destroyed, killed the National Guardsmen. And again, the broadcast went silent. Back at the studio again, they picked up the broadcast. And this time, they had an announcement from the U.S. Secretary of the Interior saying that residents of Newark and New York City must evacuate immediately and that more explosions were detected on the surface of Mars. Pretty soon there were reports of other cylinders landing near other major cities, Chicago, St. Louis. And they told how this one tripod bonded together with some other ones that also landed in New Jersey and began making their way to New York where they were spreading, spreading a noxious black poisonous gas that was killing hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of citizens instantly. Now, as this broadcast went out, American citizens all over our country panicked. They were terrified. There was looting. People evacuated cities. Pregnant women went into labor. Some people committed suicide. One woman in Indianapolis ran into a church prayer meeting shouting, New York City has been destroyed. The end of the world has come. And all of this is a true story. Except for the part about the Martians. There was a radio broadcast that night of Martians landing in New Jersey and killing hundreds and thousands of people. And American citizens really did panic listening to the radio broadcast. They panicked because they believed something that wasn't even real. Now today we listen to that and we say, really, how could they be so naive? How could they be so gullible listening to a radio show about a Martian invasion that they had that kind of response? Well, the late 1930s, were a tumultuous time in America. 
Europe was teetering on the brink of another all-out war. The effects of the Great Recession were still being felt and felt, and food scarcity was still a very real thing. Just a few weeks earlier, in the Northeast, the Great New England Hurricane of 1938 killed nearly 1,000 people and left over 60,000 people homeless. Add to that that it's after dark, the night before Halloween, and America was an emotional tinderbox, just waiting for a spark. Enter Orson Welles, the 23-year-old actor and producer of the Mercury Theater on the Air a new radio program from CBS Radio. Now, radio broadcast was a new innovation and medium at that time. It was the first medium to blur the lines between fact and fiction, between news and entertainment, and Wells was a prodigy. The Mercury Theater on the Air was only four months old, and already the critics loved the show, but you know how indie art can be. Sometimes what the critics love doesn't gain widespread appeal, and Wells did not have a major sponsor yet. Part of the problem was his time slot was up against the most popular radio show of 1938, the Chase and Sanborn Hour. And he knew that if he did not land a major sponsor quickly, the Mercury Theater would fail. So he bought the right to H.G. Wells' book, The War of the Worlds, had his screenwriter adapt it to be an hour-long sci-fi radio program that took place in modern New Jersey, and the rest is history. Now, there's no evidence that he anticipated that this kind of mayhem and pandemonium would break out as a result of his radio show. In fact... At the beginning of the show and at the first commercial break, which was an astonishing 38 minutes into the program, the audience was told that they were listening to a work of fiction. It was just a program for entertainment purposes only. But Americans weren't listening at the beginning of the show. They were listening to the Chase and Sanborn Hour, which had its first commercial break 15 minutes into the show. And at that time, many Americans turned the dial to the Mercury Theater on the air. And at that point, they were alarmed with very realistic sounding news flashes of terror up and down the eastern seaboard. In fact, we know that some people who tuned in late missed the whole part about Martians. They thought we were suffering a German invasion, that they had developed some kind of advanced weaponry because the memory of Germany's use of gas in World War I was still a fresh and haunting memory for us back then. Lies are powerful. A Martian invasion that never happened caused very real damage. So much damage that the next morning, the New York Times ran a front page story talking about the widespread mayhem and panic that had broken out the night before. The New York Daily News ran a headline that read, Fake Radio War Stirs Terror Through U.S. And all of this happened simply because people believed something that wasn't even true. Today, over eight decades later, America is again an emotional tinderbox. Europe is again dangerously close to all-out war. Americans are more divided against one another than at any point in our history, perhaps, since the time of the Civil War. And the causes of our division are simple. Americans are believing things that simply are not true. Some people believe that Joe Biden legitimately won the 2020 presidential election. Other people believe it was stolen from Donald Trump. Some people believe that white privilege is a real thing. 
and that there are racist tendencies baked into the very institutions of our culture. Other people believe that while there certainly are a few racist people out there, America is the land of opportunity where everyone gets an equal shake. Some people believe that vaccines save lives. Other people believe that vaccines are dangerous. Some people believe that masks can reduce the spread of COVID. Other people believe that masks are a form of government control. Some people believe that vanilla ice was the best white wrapper. <laughs> Other people believe it was M&M. Now, think reasonably for a moment. Wherever you land with those, think, think with me for a moment. All of those beliefs cannot be equally true. It's, it's impossible for them to be equally true. Some of them are misleading truths. Some of them are partial truths. Some are slanted truths. And some are flat out lies. But Americans are believing lies. And as a result, there's division. There's conflict because lies are powerful. Now, do you know anyone who in the past two years who's had friendships strained or lost over any of those topics or beliefs I just mentioned? Do you know anyone? Do you know anyone who's had any family relationships strained or lost over the last two years because of any of the topics I just mentioned? Or let's make it a little more personal, shall we? As I was telling you about the Martian invasion and Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds, you weren't feeling anything emotionally except perhaps curiosity to our little history lesson. But what were you feeling when I went through that list of the beliefs that are dividing Americans today? What was going on in your inner life? Confusion, anger, fear. Maybe you were getting judgmental. Maybe some of you who are politically conservative were thinking to yourself, he better not side with the liberals. Perhaps some of you who are more progressive politically thought to yourself, he better not side with the Republicans. Why, why is there so much unrest within us today? Why, why is there so much division around us today? It's because lies, when they are believed, have unleashed an incredible destructive force in our lives and in our world. You know who knows this better than anybody? Russia. Russia was the inventor of disinformation. All the way back in the Cold War, the KGB pioneered a tactic to confuse the West called disinformation. They would implant spies in the media, in entertainment, to bring in not flat-out lies, but misleading truths, partial truths. And the goal was to keep people in the West confused, distracted, chasing our own tails, so that we wouldn't be able to pay attention to what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. Now, their approach and their tactics have grown incredibly refined in the digital age. Russia's in the spotlight today for invading Ukraine, but they have been at war with the West for the last 10 years with their disinformation campaigns. Did you know that the Kremlin has been linked to every single one of those divisive topics I mentioned? Except for the best white rapper. To my knowledge, there have been no links between them. Some of you just have poor taste and choose vanilla ice over M&M. But they've been linked to all of them. And I would argue that their disinformation campaign was a far more effective war tool than invading Ukraine. Because no one two months ago could have imagined anything happening in our world that would 
put every single nation in the West in solidarity with each other. Nobody could have imagined the revival of NATO and that treaty and the strength of these allies. But Putin single-handedly did that through invading Ukraine. He unified the West. He unified America around one common belief. That guy's evil. I would argue they're far more effective in their campaign to spread disinformation and lies in the West because lies are powerful. Now, as an aside, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for a 60 second timeout here. Um, not because I'm looking for a sponsor, but if any sponsors are watching online, Hope Church will accept that. <clears throat> Our TVs can be Sony or Panasonic. We don't care. This, this isn't really part of my sermon, but the pastor in me compels me to say something right here. So, you know, time out. Let me talk about this. Because lies are everywhere and because lies are powerful, this is the reason why the biblical authors tell Christians to practice discernment discerning between truth and untruth. Because lies are everywhere around us. And Christians, those of us who follow Jesus, our allegiance, listen, our allegiance is not to the left or to the right. Our allegiance is to Jesus. We serve the interest of God's kingdom. We follow Jesus. He's our king. Which means that when we read something on social media, we do not believe it unless the sources can be verified. It means if you get your news primarily from CNN, you better double check with what the BBC has to say about it. If you get your news from the Epic Times, you better verify what PBS has to say about it because every outlet has a bias and we cannot let ourselves be played by people with power or political influence because they are not acting in the interest of God's kingdom. And as long as I've waited this far into it, if your favorite commentators or authors or whoever Whoever it is, don't just tell you the news, but they tell you how to interpret the news. They are using you for their agendas. Just get the facts. Use the Bible to interpret the news. If the people you love to follow throw things out like, I'm just asking questions. No, they're not. They don't want to say the flat out lie because you'll recognize it. So they use a misleading truth to guide you to support their agendas and causes. If when you take in the news, your reaction is outrage rather than prayer, you're getting played. Because Christians follow Jesus and we serve him and we practice discernment while we figure out how to live in and love the people all around us. Because lies are powerful. Rant over back to the sermon. Thank you for your grace. Russians aren't the only one who know, lies, who know that lies are powerful. Right now, there's another enemy who knows the power of lies. And they are spiritual in nature. Right now, there are spiritual enemies who are waging war, and the territory they're waging for is your own soul. It's what the biblical authors refer to as spiritual warfare. Now, as soon as I go here, some of you who are new to the church, you're like, oh no, I was just liking this church. Here's where they go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs talking about the devil and stuff. Now, hear me out, hear me out. On paper, our lives are really good. You know, we complain about inflation and gas prices, but we have access to ample food, ample clothing, ample shelter. Most of us can hop on a plane and be anywhere on the planet within 24 hours. We have unlimited luxury, entertainment, and comfort compared to the richest man on planet Earth just one century ago. To say nothing of the thousands of years of human civilization that preceded that. On paper, our lives are really good. So why do we take so many antidepressants? Why is there so much anxiety 
within us? Why are we so angry about our comfortable and good and easy lives? So many of the people I've been talking with lately tell me, I'm just tired of it all. I'm exhausted. I'm frustrated. Why? If our lives are so good, why is that? Because there's a war going on. And it's a war for your soul. It's a war for your inner life. It's a war for your emotional and spiritual health. Now, I think war metaphors are overused, generally speaking. You know, when you're watching the, the sports broadcast and they use combat metaphors, you're like, no, what happens in Ukraine is combat. This is just sports. It's generally overused. But what's interesting is our spiritual fathers had no problem using war metaphors to talk about spiritual warfare, which is interesting because they followed a rabbi who was notoriously nonviolent, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, when Peter tried to use a sword to prevent his arrest, he rebuked Peter and willingly gave up his life for his enemies to bless his enemies. He was nonviolent. The church fathers all the way through the fourth century were known for being pacifists. Yet when it came to our spiritual lives, they had no problem talking about a war metaphor. In fact, here's what Paul the Apostle wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, Put on the full armor of God, better suit up, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle. He said, there's a real struggle against a real enemy, and you need to put the armor on. It's not against flesh and blood. Pause. The struggle is not against flesh and blood. If you view another human as your primary enemy, be it the Proud Boys or Antifa, the left or the right, if you view other humans as the enemy, you are losing the spiritual battle. Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Who is it against? But, stay with me to the end, the, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, at first, it sounds like he's talking about the government. That is not what he is talking about. There are different ranks of spiritual evil called authorities and powers. That's why he says they're of this dark world and they're in the heavenly realms. There's the earthly realm and there are the heavenly realms. There's the material world and there's the immaterial world. And Paul the Apostle writes that there are very real forces of evil in the immaterial world, in the spiritual world, in the heavenly realms, and they are struggling against you. And whether or not you know it, you need to be prepared to struggle against them. Now, the biblical authors identify three different enemies that are waging war for your soul, over your soul. I'm going to identify them today, and we're going to spend the next several weeks breaking each of them down, talking about how they work and what we can do about it, because if we lose this war, at best, you're going to have a corroded inner life. At worst, we walk away from God. And live a life of emptiness on earth until life ends and we stand for judgment. This is a real war and a real conflict. Here's the first combatant. Peter said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, we're going to spend two weeks, the next two weeks, talking about the devil. So for those of you who say... Really? The devil, Jason? Really? So, so um, first of all, you probably have the wrong idea of the devil in your mind. You're probably thinking of Will Ferrell on SNL in a devil suit or something. It's not who the devil is. Um, we're going to spend two weeks figuring out who he is, but for now, here's what you need to know. If you take Jesus seriously at all, Jesus clearly identified the devil as a real enemy. And if you believe there are forces of supernatural good, God, angels, etc., why wouldn't you also entertain the idea that there could be forces of supernatural evil, a devil, demons? But we learned in the previous verse from Paul that the devil schemes, and we're going to learn more about how he schemes over the next couple of weeks. But that's the first spiritual enemy that is defined for us in the Bible, the devil. Second spiritual enemy 
The Apostle Paul again wrote, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I'm going to pause there. Um, Flesh is a Greek word uh, translated into the English word flesh, and it's a word that has a wide lexical range. Um, For example, sometimes the word can be used to talk about the fact that you have a physical body, okay? Um, It's like the, the word we just looked at. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, just a physical body. Um, when the word is used in the plural, it's just talking about humanity, mankind, right? It's, it's all the flesh, all the people, all humanity. Um, sometimes it can be used to refer to a person's race or ethnicity or culture or nation of origin. But it can also be used, as it's used here, to talk about something inside of us, inside of every single one of us, that wants life to be all about me. It's about self-glory, desires, being true to my inner voice. I want to be the center of the universe. I want to be the center of work. I want to be the center at church. I want to be the center of my family. It's me, 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 me. Entertain me. Meet my needs. Okay? It's the self, the flesh. And he says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. What does the Spirit desire? That we love God, that we exalt God, worship God, that we love and serve our neighbor as ourself. But the flesh says, nope, it's about me. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in what? Conflict with each other. Do you ever know that when there's good things you want to do, it is a struggle at times to do the good things you want to do? Have you noticed that the bad things you want to resist, you end up sometimes doing them anyway? That's the second spiritual enemy, the flesh, the part within us that wants it to be all about me. Here's the third one. John tells us about it. For everything in the world, pause. Again, world is a Greek word. It's some lexical range. It can literally mean planet earth. Um, But in other cases, like here, what it's talking about is a system of values, beliefs, um, understanding, or worldview of how life works. We might just say culture. Every single culture has beliefs and opinions and assumptions and biases, and, and all of these create the culture. And that's what John is talking about. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So the biblical authors identify three spiritual enemies waging war for your soul. The devil, we're going to talk about him for two weeks. The flesh, we're going to talk about that the week after that. And the world, we're going to talk about that the week after that. And now they come together to form a strategy because they're an alliance. And here's the big idea we are going to spend the entire series unpacking. So this is what you came for right here. If you have a program, get those pens ready, click them open. We're going to give you the big idea of the whole series. Here's how we're going to see. Here's how they work. Deceptive ideas. This is the work of the devil. Mistruths, partial truths, 99% truths, but Matt, 1%. It's key. The devil schemes, he's the father of lies, deceptive ideas from the devil play to disordered desires, the flesh, the part in me, the part in you that wants life to be all about me instead of a desire that is set on God and my neighbor, it's a desire that is set on me and my pleasure, my satisfaction, my comfort, me, 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 me. So the deceptive ideas play to disordered desires that are normalized in culture that are celebrated in culture, that are accepted in culture, that you're looked at as strange if you just don't go along with everybody else in culture. This is their strategy, and this is what we are going to unpack for the next five weeks. Now, for the balance of our time, which I don't have a lot of, for the balance of our time, uh, I want to lay the foundation for an exercise I'm going to ask, challenge, cajole, persuade, beg each of you to do, because it is what will make your time here in the room worth it. It's what will make your time online worth it, and it will set you up to get the most out of the rest of this series. So I'm going to give you the foundation, and then I'm going to give you the exercise. So shifting gears, here's the foundation. Behind every behavior is a belief. 
Behind everything you do, you believe something about this situation. For example, two people see a brand new car. One person will do anything to get it. The other person is not interested in it. Two people see beer in a cooler. One person instinctively grabs it, cracks the top. The other person goes looking for a bottle of water. Two people see a two-pound bag of peanut M&Ms on the counter. One person proceeds to crush half that bag. The other person is not at all interested. Why are there different behaviors? Because they believe different things. One person believes alcohol will relieve pain. Another person believes alcohol will increase pain. Their beliefs shape their behaviors. One person believes peanut M&Ms will bring them pleasure. The other person has a peanut allergy and believes peanut M&Ms will kill her. Two beliefs, two different outcomes. One person believes a new car will bring them prestige and joy. Another person believes money in the bank will bring them security. Different beliefs, different outcomes, okay? Behind every behavior is a belief. Now, let's break this down and talk about our destructive behaviors. Behind every destructive behavior is an unhealthy emotion. You show me an uh, destructive behavior, unfaithfulness, drunkenness, overspending. Pick any destructive behavior you want. Behind it's an unhealthy emotion, hatred, greed, lust, pride, selfishness, okay? Behind every unhealthy behavior or every destructive behavior is an unhealthy emotion. Third, behind every unhealthy emotion is a belief. Some of you grew up in a home where your family moved all the time and you would go to a new school and you would make some new friends and right as you made friends, your family moved again. And that shaped the way you viewed friendships. You learned that you got hurt when you made friends, when you were vulnerable, when you connected with people. So you started to believe that the best way to live life is to close off from others and not be vulnerable with them and not put yourself out there. And as a result, you don't have a lot of friends or a lot of joy. Some of you grew up in a home where you were only approved when you performed. It's only when you won the trophy. It's only when you got good grades. It's only when you did everything right that your parents acknowledged you. And you started to believe that my value as a human being is based on my performance. And as a result, you're exhausted today. See, behind every unhealthy emotion is something you believe. And it's based on what you've lived in life. If I lived your life, I would believe those things too. So here's the point. Your beliefs shape your emotions and your behaviors. This is the reason why it is critical to discern between truth and lies. Because if lies shape what we believe, what we believe is not aligned with reality, which means our emotions are out of align with reality, and our behaviors will not lead to our flourishing. So here's what we want to focus on for the rest of our time. Winning the war for your soul against our three spiritual enemies, requires you to reverse engineer your behaviors. In America, we focus on our behaviors. It's a new year. I'm going to lose 20 pounds, or we're going to focus on our behaviors. But that doesn't get to the emotions driving those behaviors, and it doesn't get to what you believe that shapes those emotions that shapes those behaviors. So your exercise today is going to have to do with reverse engineering the things in your life to start to get some clarity about what you actually believe Because Jesus said, when we believe the truth, it will set us free. And we need to do this because, remember, deceptive ideas play to disordered desires that are normalized in culture. This is the strategy of the enemy. But when our beliefs are aligned with the truth of God and His Word and the universe as it actually is, do you know what emotions result in our inner life? Galatians tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit, I love that word fruit, If you go to Napa Valley, I've never been there. I hear it's lovely. If you go to Napa Valley, if you listen real closely, you know what you don't hear? You don't hear the vines going, pushing out grapes. You know why? Because fruit is just born from healthy vines. And Paul says, if your spirit is healthy, the spirit that desires what is contrary to the flesh, if the spirit within you is healthy, the fruit of that is love. You can't manufacture love. It's the fruit of a healthy inner life that's aligned with God. It's joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Tell me something. If this is your inner life, what kind of behaviors are going to flow out of that? Behaviors that are going to lead to your flourishing and the flourishing of the people around you. But we don't start with behaviors, and we don't even start with the fruit. We start with the Spirit. We start with what we believe about God, what we believe about who we are, what we believe about what a flourishing life, what the good life really is. So with all that, please carve out some time this week. For your, it doesn't help me, you're not turning it in, I don't get commission. Please take some time to work through these two exercises this week. Uh, here's the first one, it's at the end of your notes. Number one, identify three destructive behaviors. You don't have to show anyone, this isn't show and tell, just you can probably think of three things in your life, behaviors you don't like because they're not healthy. Two, identify three healthy behaviors. We're not just going to beat you up. What are three things that are going pretty well, that you're doing pretty good, that you're like, yeah, these are leading to my flourishing or the flourishing of people around me. Next, what emotions are driving those behaviors? I mean, when you reach for one too many drinks, what, what emotion is behind that? When you... When you Click in one one click purchase at Amazon. What 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 emotion is behind that? When, when you're really patient with annoying people, what what emotion is behind that? Okay. And then last point, what beliefs are shaping those emotions? What do you believe about this situation? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about who you are and your purpose in life? What do you believe about what the good life really looks like that's shaping all of this? You want to reverse engineer it so we can get to this level. Now, uh, for those of you who want extra credit, and if you're in a, a, a small group here at Hope, if you're going for the extra credit, if you're not in a small group at Hope, uh, you can still do this exercise. But this is some pre-work for your groups this week. It's uh, on the group section of your handout, of your message notes today. Um, here's some second level thinking to get you ready for your groups or just to work through and get you ready for the rest of the series. Three questions. What lies do I believe about who God is? Where is your thinking about God misaligned with the reality of God? Number two, what lies do I believe about who I am? Do you believe that you're God's beloved child purchased by the blood of Jesus and your purpose is to love God and love your neighbor? Or do you believe something else? Third, what lies do I believe about what the good life is? What is the good life? What does it look like to flourish as a human being? And does that align with the biblical picture? of what the good life looks like. So that's your homework. Uh, reverse engineer three of your behaviors, good and bad. Uh, trace it down to what you believe that's leading to those emotions, leading to those behaviors. And take this little lie inventory, and we're going to pick it up there next week because we have a real enemy who uses deceptive ideas that play to disordered desires that are normalized in culture. But Jesus came to give us freedom. Jesus came to deliver us from that. Jesus came to give us forgiveness, to make us God's children, to make us citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And as we continue to internalize the truth, that's what sets our inner lives free. Let's pray. Father in heaven, When we encounter truths in the scriptures that are challenging or difficult, help us to see and trust that it's because you love us. And you're going to tell us things that are true because you want us to live lives that are free spiritually, free emotionally, free to serve you and glorify you, just like we will be doing for all of eternity because you, Jesus, you loved us with the sacrificial love. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will dwell in us. You will guide our thoughts. You will soften our hearts. You will be alive in us so that in our inner lives we bear fruit. That love is born in us. That joy is born in us. That forbearance is born in us. That kindness is born in us. 
See, that's something that our culture doesn't see normalized. But we believe that if they see it in your church, they'll want to know you, the living God. So Spirit, give us wisdom, give us discernment, give us truth, so that we can be people who are truly people who are free. Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen.